All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of O365A. In this episode, we have Evan Zalescheck from Microsoft, who is a senior partner technical architect, to talk to us about, you know, I guess applying Teams features to your day to day work and how that, you know, can be solved for you know uh, organizations and, and the stuff that he he works with uh, within the field. So welcome, Evan. Thanks for coming on and speaking with us. Um, maybe tell tell us a little bit about yourself and sort of how you got into Microsoft in this role. Sure, and and thanks guys for bringing me onto this call. It's kind of like um, a school reunion of sorts because of course you're all four MVPs and I was an MVP for a period of time. Interestingly enough, when I came to Microsoft. That month, I had been renewed for my fifth year and had to relinquish my MVP because you can't be an MVP at, at Microsoft. But it's, it's great to be in great company once again. Um, yeah, so to be my my history, geez, a long history of being a Microsoft partner of various sorts. So I think about 25 years of my career before joining Microsoft was spent in the in the partner ecosystem. Everything from starting a consulting company when I was quite young, when the organization I was working for went bankrupt and I decided to take over my clients through to working at some of the Canadian telecoms, um, doing startups, acquiring partners restructuring them and then and, and selling them and uh, it was interesting when I was um, at a Canadian telecom it was back in office communication server R1 those days which I'm sure you all remember and I looked at the product and I was the Microsoft guy at this telco and I looked at it and I said this thing's a PBX yeah. even though Microsoft's saying no 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 we have the innovative communications alliance with Nortel and we're bringing those two worlds together but then OCS R2 came out and I was saying to my leadership, this thing's a PBX and everybody's saying, no nah, way, not Microsoft. And lo and behold, look at where we are today. So I came to Microsoft about four years ago. Um, Jason Bromit, now my best friend, because he hired me into the organization, had an opportunity for me to come to Microsoft in a capacity that I never heard of before. Microsoft was making investments in partners. In the partner community because they knew that that's what they needed to do in order to be successful and i joined uh, something called the voice practice development unit which was a team of architects focused on cloud voice and helping partners first of all understand how they can monetize cloud voice and then helping them bring that to market so in my role then and now as it's morphed into teams my responsibility is really strategic and, and tactical. So having conversations with my leadership when we started office or so when we started one commercial partner, it was really we need to be level 400 deep strategic and in, in Microsoft terms, that's very deep strategic to help partners understand this team's concept and and how they could embrace it and build a practice around it and then level 400 technical so that we could help enable them everywhere from being able to sell the product to being able to do the technical pre-sales and design the deployment the support and manage services so realistically in my role at microsoft i put on the partner hat and i helped them to be able to build or enhance an existing practice around Microsoft Cloud technologies while being competitive. Oh, that's, that, that's perfect. And, and I, I was lucky enough to, to work with Evan pre-Microsoft pre almost like a decade ago. And I got to see you, know, you, you in action and you, know, you helped me get into the MVP program, move away from being like a Microsoft generalist and becoming a specialist. And so you're, you're kind of doing the same kind of mentorship with these partners. And so when you go into these you know, large Microsoft partners that have been in this consulting space for a long time, and you're in front of their, you know, their, their technical experts, you know, the, the cream of the crop, how are you going in there and you know, positioning how to change the way they think and how they educate their customers from going you know, deep technical and really getting that functionality to what their customers' pain points are? Yeah, that's a great question and a good point, Michael, because uh, I'll tell you, I'm not as technical as e any of you on this call. Right? I know I know the four of you well, and 
you beat me hands down. And in walking into an organization and and getting deep into the technical bits, well, first of all, I think Microsoft has a lot of assets for people that want to learn the deep technical pieces of, let's say, in this case, Microsoft Teams. But what I feel is really important is there's a role that we all have to start playing if we're not playing it already. We have our pure sellers. And we have the people that are great at deployments. And like I said, those deployment uh, enablement resources are readily available from Microsoft. But there's this role in between. And when, Michael, you and I work together, that's the role I played in our organization. I wasn't sales. I wasn't a technical deployment person. But I called it technical pre-sales. At Microsoft, it's kind of a, I would call it a combination between a, a TSP and an SSP, or now what we call a Teams TS and a sales uh, professional, where you've got technical capabilities and sales capabilities, but you also understand strategy. And so when I'm talking to a lot of these organizations, it's not so much teams, don't think of it as a, a, just a product. It's a solution. It's a solution for you and your organization, but it's also a solution for your customers. But that solution is going to look different for every customer. Teams is kind of like a snowflake. The way we, you deploy it for even two companies in the same vertical market is going to be very different. So, for example, the five of us on this call, if we all shared our desktops and shared our Teams client, they would all look completely different because I have tailored my Teams client for my work life, just like all four of you have done. Now, you look at that from a, a Teams deployment perspective and from an organizational perspective, it's the same thing. So, really, the question that I try to get the partners to answer for their customers is, what are your business pain points? What are your business processes? Let's design the solution to address your business pain points and improve upon your business processes. Once you know the answers to those questions, the design of teams kind of takes care of itself. But on that same note, you need as a partner or as consultants, to be able to understand that organization so as they change how does teams change to meet those objectives and as teams changes how do you make the customer aware that hey there's these new features in teams great so what well this is how they would apply to you and your organization or conversely they may not apply to you in your organization yeah that's a that's an excellent point and then al along the same theme uh what do you find the top sort of say two recommendations for a, a team's partner looking to take it to the next level and really beef up their practice? What would the top two uh, sort of tricks or insight you would you would give them? Yeah, I think from a Microsoft perspective, if, if for everybody out there that that isn't aware, of course we're focused on driving Teams adoption. At Microsoft, we call it Teams monthly active usage. But even more so, and this was even pre-COVID, it was we need to focus on calling and meetings. So being able to enable those workloads with consistency and with um, resiliency. So we're in a meeting right now. Most of us are in meetings all day long. So to me, it's not just being able to make meetings work, but partners need to be able to bring the wow factor to their customers to say, hey, look, this is a feature in Microsoft Teams meetings and how it applies to you. So I think meetings and calling are really a, a primary focus or should be a primary focus for a lot of people. For example, this is a story I love to tell. I sit at my desk all day long, just like you do. Now we're in a meeting and maybe someone's presenting some content. We're all communicating, we're talking to each other because we want to improve that content. Now. My doorbell rings. I'm the only person at home and I'm expecting that important Amazon package or whatever it happens to be. What do I do? I say, hey, wait, guys, no, wait, I stop. I got to go. I'm not going to tell you guys to stop because everybody's a busy person. So what do I do? I grab my mobile device. I grab and open up my Teams client. And what am I presented with right away? Oh, it knows that I'm in another meeting. And it says, would you like to join that meeting from this device where you're using your audio only from your desktop and the rest of the contents here or do you want to transfer to the call to this device when would you use one versus the other well if i'm going to be back at my desk before the meeting's over maybe i'm just going to have the content 
on my mobile device. If I'm not going to be at my desk before the meeting's over, or maybe I have to leave my office or leave my home, I'm going to transfer to this device. So, Curtis, kind of having partners make sure they understand these features and then the stories that can apply towards these features. As soon as you tell someone a story, there's two things that happen. One is because it's changed the way I work, I'm passionate about that. So you can hear the passion in my voice and people get excited and they're like, I want to try that too. So that's the first thing that happens. But the second thing that happens is people are compelled because now they're like, wait a minute, I've been in that scenario. I've had to go and answer the door. I've had to let my dog out so it doesn't use the bathroom on the rug. I can do that now without interrupting the flow of a conversation. And even from the mobile client, we all know how powerful it is. I encourage everybody to play with it. You can do so much. You can run the entire meeting from the mobile client. But until you're put into the scenario where, one, you either have to use it, or two, someone's taught you how to use it, how do you know how to apply it? So one, I think meetings and calling are an important focus. And then as we move forward, and I know Michael's really good at this, it's, well, how can we make teams do things that it doesn't do natively? And I'm talking about applications. We've seen applications in Teams channels and, and even in chats, but now we have applications being exposed in meetings. Mm -hmm. So, wow, let's talk about making meetings more inclusive and getting people to pay more attention. When I've got a, when someone pops up an app on my screen, when I'm in a meeting, I'm paying attention because I'm expected to provide answers. If I'm not paying attention, it's just going to sit there and it's going to wait for me to respond. So I like it because I can bring people into the conversation, something that I used to love to do when I was standing on stage. That was easy. Now it's a little more difficult. So let's leverage these features. So to me, partners should be focused on meetings and calling. And as they progress, well, those applications and those make it sticky. And, and that's that's really interesting, and that's a great segue. As as I was just about to ask you about apps, um, Evan, and it's like as a non-developer, like that's the single biggest thing that uh, excites me um, about Teams for sure. And I think where I got the bug was when at Ignite they they talked about DataVerse, and uh, where then it was um, I can't even remember what they called it now. But it says DataVerse Oakdale, now, right? Oakdale. Oakdale Project Oakdale. Thank you. Oh and, yes, um, yeah. You know, I went off and and tried to develop an app and right within teams. And I thought that was like the aha moment for me was I didn't have to leave the teams client. And I just, I think I built some basic app that tracked the podcasts that we were doing and people could auto generate something. And it just really kind of was an awakening. And, and, and so I guess maybe expand on that a bit. Like this, this seems like the sky's the limit in terms of apps, oh, um, but, but where do you like, you know, the next five years, maybe, what do you what do you think we're going to start to see in that space or and maybe what, what do you think you know more importantly partners and people interested in this should focus on yeah i think that, that's and you made a really interesting point do you know that i want to emphasize is that you did all that within the team's client you didn't leave the team's client to develop the app and i'm a huge advocate of trying to spend as much time as I possibly can within the Teams client and not do application switching. Because there's research that shows that reduces your productivity. For example, I don't like going into Outlook in my email client because as soon as I see a bunch of unread messages, what am I compelled to do? Click on all of them and try addressing them. So I've, I've implemented um, tools and my own best practices to try to keep me away from that. Developing an app within the Teams client same kind of thing. And we could do the low code, no code development. It's really easy. And I mean, there's a lot of different uh, methodologies and then it, you can get, you know, using Power Platform, but then you can get into Graph API and doing some coding. So really it's available for all levels of developers and even someone that, like yourself and <clears throat> myself who had never developed an app before, we can do that now. But I think from a future perspective, one of the things I really like about apps and, and again, bringing them into meetings, mm -hmm. but, and I was talking to a, a customer about this today. I was showing the customer how you set up a meeting, not in the Outlook client, in the Teams client. And I went through all the features and how you can see availability very easily. I actually like it better than the mm -hmm. Outlook client. But one thing that you can't really do from the Outlook client or you haven't been able to do is set that meeting mm -hmm. in the Teams channel. And of course, the question came up, well, why would you want to do that? Well, 
let's think about it. When we talk about a meeting itself, when we had this meeting, we probably did some planning. I had a conversation with Michael beforehand and you all might have had a conversation before. So there's a pre-meeting experience where we have to do some planning. Maybe it's the creation of some content. Maybe it's the creation of some questions. Then we have the meeting itself. The meeting can be recorded. We can have meeting mm -hmm. notes. We can have transcription of that meeting. Mm -hmm. And maybe we expose some applications, gathering feedback on, let's say, a project that we were all involved in because we want to be better. We want to improve. So let's gather data. And then the post-meeting experience. Now, the post-meeting experience is the one that I found really interesting. Early with Teams, I started saying, you know what? Microsoft Teams has enabled me to participate in fewer meetings every day. How many people out there want to participate in more meetings every day? If anybody puts up their hand, I don't know what's wrong. So the reason I don't have to participate in any me as many meetings is because think about the life cycle of a meeting. If we have that meeting in a channel, we do our planning in that channel, we have the meeting and the recording and all the data we've gathered in the meeting in the channel. Now we can go and execute on our, our to-do list or the tasks at hand. And as we're doing that, we're seeing that within the context of the channel. So what used to have to happen when we are wrapping up a meeting, we got two minutes left. We're like, okay, we can't get through the rest of this. We need to schedule our next meeting. With Teams, we don't do that anymore. We don't have to do that. So through the conversation in the channel post meeting, as we're completing our tasks and tying in things to, well, our, 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 our tasks within Teams, the tasks you can expose in that channel, we're seeing the work get done. And then we may decide, well, now we need to have that next follow-up meeting. It could have or we may not need it at all because the conversations continue. So from an apps perspective, I really think, depending on how the way we work changes, there are the apps that you know we could use for meetings like this, but then I look at, there's two types really. In, in, in my simplicity, there's two types of apps. There's vertical apps, so let's say healthcare, financial services, et cetera. And then there's horizontal apps that apply to something like human resources across all organizations. But I think where what is really key is that if you go into an organization, and again, remember I talked about two two the same vertical, same diff, two different organizations having different pain points. The app that works for this customer may not work for this customer. So you can get into some custom, and I think that's what we're going to see is some custom development of apps for specific uh, customers and use case scenarios, as well as horizontal apps. There's a partner that I that I work with that developed an app for um, adoption, and it applies for everybody, all their customers. It's they install it by default, and it becomes part of the, the team's window for all these uh, end users. And then they're collecting the data to show that, hey, you know what, using this app with this customer has increased the adoption of Teams and overall satisfaction, whereas this customer didn't have that app and we don't see that same growth. So I don't think it's anything too terribly complex. It's just finding what are those business pain points? What are those business processes that we can make better through Teams and the potential of development of an app? Beyond that, I know that when we start thinking about meetings, and I think it was a few years ago where uh, at Microsoft Build, we saw the future of meetings, the, the, the future of meeting rooms where it's no touch join, which we're starting to see now where we can say, hey, Cortana, start my meeting. And then when that meeting starts, nobody has to touch their keyboard and we're, it, people are, are, are talking and, it's, and we're seeing this coming now, it's transcribing my vo my voice, your voice, everybody's voice, and identifying each one of us. And then as I say, hey, you know what, Dino, that's a good point. We should take that away and get back to you. Well, instead of us finding, putting a task, Cortana picks up on it. AI picks up on it, says that looks like a task. So, and, and it was Evan saying Dino's name. So I'm going to connect the task to those two people. So I think there's going to be some stuff that comes out from Microsoft that's going to really help the productivity in meetings, but partners, I mean, the partners mm -hmm. are going to do more because they can focus on the particular customer requirements that they have, again, whether it's vertical or horizontal. That's my thoughts. Maybe not Microsoft's, but that's what I've seen. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm hoping 
happens. And it, just, so, just a just a, a quick thought there too. I mean, that starts with knowing your customer, right? Knowing their processes, knowing their pain yeah. points, develop the the app that meets their needs. Yeah, and Curtis, you almost set me up perfectly for this. Microsoft is again in in recent years we've we've started releasing um, workshops. And and Michael recall when we worked together, we used to do something called an architecture and design workshop for our customers, where I'd go on site with someone smart like Michael or another one of our architects and spend two or three days um, interviewing the customer, walking through the organization, watching how they work, and then sitting down and doing a whiteboard session with them because we didn't have Surface Hubs back then. So we were doing a whiteboard session and started understanding the customer's organization, their current infrastructure. And that time spent, whether it was two days, three days, four days, and sometimes five days was invaluable. Now, it was nice because we were also on site with the customers. So we would go out for lunch with them. Uh, we would maybe go out for dinner with them and get to know them a little personally. But we'd also see new opportunities like there was one customer in Southern California and we're walking through their office and we're looking at their meeting rooms and they're all different. And we're like, how do you use this meeting room? How do you use this meeting room? Well, and they, we're like, oh boy. So right away, meeting room opportunity. How would you like it to work in this meeting room? There was a very large car manufacturer that we were working mm -hmm. with. Can't say who, um, and I won't say where because it'll be too easy to mm -hmm. figure out, but they had very disparate meeting rooms. In their entire organization and there this is when i was a partner so we were there microsoft was there the customer was there everybody was kind of arguing about what to do i said did anybody talk to the people that use this meeting room i said just a minute so i ran outside and i grabbed three people that were sitting at their desks i said do you use this meeting room yeah we do do you enjoy using this meeting room mm -hmm. yeah okay come on in here now i felt sorry for them because these three people had to stand up in front of a group of about 25 people including it and microsoft and some executives I said can you tell me what you don't like about this room okay can you tell me what you would like to see in this room thank you very much when they left I said, did anybody ask these people how they use this room and what they think or was this something that was just a decision made by somebody upstairs so really curtis mm -hmm. i think that those those um workshops i think we call them accelerators now partner accelerators are designed to do exactly that microsoft actually funds some of these programs for our partners to go and spend the time with their customers and sure we can't go out on site anymore at least for the time being but we can sure spend a lot of time like this and see the habits of the organization and make sure you're asking questions and sometimes they don't know what they don't know so it's our job my job is to educate our partners to be able to tell the customers what they don't know and therefore understand that hey this is the world of possibilities that paging system that you have in your organization and this happened to me last month we need paging well microsoft teams doesn't do paging and i said to them but why do you need paging well we've had it for 20 years well wait a minute, maybe that's the problem right there. You're using technology that's 20 years old. Is there not a better way to do this? Let's talk about the scenario where you would use paging. Well, someone comes calls into the front office and we need to page somebody in the office because there's a phone call for them. How many times have we all called into an organization and been put on hold and maybe we're upset and we're put on hold and we wait. I'm waiting to talk to somebody. Maybe a minute later, that phone rings reception again and they answer, hello, this is Contoso.com. How may I help you today? I'm waiting to talk to Evan. I'm getting more irate. Instead, why not say, hey, you know what? Oh, I see. Okay, Evan is available. You don't need to page me. It doesn't really matter where I'm in because if I'm outside of the office, paging isn't going to help. You see my presence is green and you know this guy wants to talk to Evan and he's upset. So, hey, Evan, by the way, I've got a call for you and this person's upset. Thank you. You prepared me for the call. I'm going to be extra nice to de-escalate the scenario. To me, that's a way better scenario than me being on hold, listening to bad music, getting more upset, waiting to talk to somebody. If reception would have just said, hey, you know, Evan's not available right now. 
if you go into teams, you can see the organization chart. You can see, oh, here's one of Evan's peers. Would you like to talk to Evan's colleague instead? Sure. I just want to talk to somebody. So to me, it's about one, use these workshops to understand your customers' business pains and business processes, and then ask questions. Challenge the customer when they come to you. We need paging. Okay. We need faxing. Okay. Why? We can't be afraid to ask why. And and you can do it. Okay. Well, take me through the scenario where you would use paging or take me through the scenario where you would use faxing. And I'm not saying that paging and faxing are dead. There's the necessities in some organizations, but let's find out why. And if there's a better way to do it, well, let's at least show it to them and talk to them about it. And maybe we could do a pilot and say, hey, let's try it and see. And I've been through that scenario with our 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 customers and our mm -hmm. partners and even when I was a partner myself. And it works often because as you all know Teams is a massive application. It's doing more and more and more, so much so that I have to focus on one part of it. I'm still sure I know a lot about all things Teams, but not enough. So I'm focusing on particular areas. Like Dino, you mentioned apps. I'm not a strong developer, but I've got colleagues that are. And that's how I'm starting to see this evolution of teams is I've, I need to be good at certain aspects. My colleagues will be good at other aspects. And then together we build this team to help partners. So Evan, I just wanna, I mean, that was really great, but I wanna circle back a little bit more on sort of like the partner side of things right and sure. you know when you are meeting let's say with a new partner like how do you help set them up for success with regards to how they approach um you know you you, you talked about like the different processes like the the sales and the pre-sales and the technical and the you know the level 400 like how would you maybe just at a high level would you set them up for success like as you start engaging with them yeah, and I think the first thing that I try to do is the same thing that I would do when I'd go into an organization and help them evolve as a consultant when I was a consultant, evolve or, or even restructure their organization. And it's, I, first of all, I want to get to know the organization. So everything from the leadership through to maybe a, a seasonal worker and, and get to know all the people in the organization first and then understand the people that are focused on just Microsoft in, in general, because a lot of the partners that I work with, of course, focus on Microsoft and lots of Microsoft products, but also other vendor products. So let me see the Microsoft team and let me understand that team. So for example, because Teams is, is, is rooted in foundations around Exchange Online and SharePoint Online, OneDrive for Business, and then we get into the security portfolio and meetings and voice. So I wanna know, who those people are in the organization. You've never done Teams before, that's fine. Did you do Skype for Business? No, okay, well, have you ever worked on a PBX? Some organizations might not know what a PBX is, but have you ever worked on phone systems from other vendors? So I try to get that foundational level of knowledge of the organization. And then what we start to do is, well, okay, what is it that you want to take to market? You as an organization, what do you want to do with Teams? Do you wanna be just like the partner next door or how are you gonna differentiate themselves yourselves? That's why it's good to understand the entire organization because maybe, then I'm working with this a partner like this already, they've got a, a fantastic endpoint managed services um, organization, a great development arm and uh, some, I won't say old PBX guys, but people that used to work on legacy PBXs. So I'm now seeing the foundation that they have to focus on teams. And now because they have dev and they have voice, well, we can address the calling piece and the application development piece, but it's really key that we have the support from the executives. And what do the executives care about? Profitability, <laughs> because we're gonna take resources and educate them or retool them so during that period of time, they're not necessarily going to be revenue generating to the same extent as they were. So we need to make sure that the executive understand the opportunity that Microsoft Teams presents for them. Once we have that buy-in, the rest of the stuff just starts to happen. So we start working with the individual or parts of the organization, sales, 
and really when we do sales enablement work it's good for every all skill sets whether you're a seller technical seller deployment person support person like licensing <laughs> We talk about team. Yeah, yeah. I wanted some smiles because you all you need a PhD, them. right? <laughs> My point exactly. I'm not a licensing expert by any stretch, but I understand the team's licensing. So when I talk about licensing, I want as many of the people that are going to focus on Microsoft Teams as part of that conversation as possible. Why? Well, as a support person, you get a call from a customer and they're having an issue. What's the issue? Maybe it's related to licensing. So that support person needs to understand. Hmm, I see this person's got domestic calling plans, but they need to make international calls and that requires communication credits. Ah, you don't have communication credits because you don't have a toll free number. Someone needs to turn this on. Let me help you with that. So as simple as that might sound as a pre sales activity, it can always be post sales. So we start at that level 100 baseline and then we proceed to 200 300 400 and we started getting that three 400 enablement like those are the technical people that's where we start to focus on specifics so it might be let's focus on meetings let's focus on calling let's focus on the dev side which i bring other colleagues in for so foundation across the board of and i think i mentioned it to you gentlemen earlier we look at the sales organization the technical pre-sales the delivery and the support slash managed services and now as well the development arm a partner or an organization that is all that great we can focus on all those areas if you're only going to focus on one that's great too we'll work within those guidelines does that make sense habib yeah, no, for sure, for sure. And then, so just so that, you know, some of our listeners who, you know, uh, are partners or, you know, wanting to be a partner. So is it uh, just registering yourself as a Microsoft partner at partner.microsoft.com and sort of going through that process to onboard themselves? And then at some point, they may be able to engage with someone like yourself or, or someone from your team uh, to be able to give them this level of understanding of the whole, um, I guess, process, right? Right. Yeah, and a uh, good point. I mean, navigating that landscape is there's a lot to it. And and you're correct. I mean, the first thing you want to do is become a Microsoft partner, because as soon as you do, there's a lot of benefits that are available to you. And then you as you grow your partner relationship, you move from what we call a network partner to silver to gold. And there's different benefits that come along with that. And as you do that, there are different groups of resources that help you through that process so ultimately i mean if it's uh, the, the the partner's desire becoming a managed partner working with one commercial partner the division that i represent or sorry that i'm a part of uh, we work with um, our top managed partners in canada so i only work with five or six partners but that doesn't mean i don't support other partners as well um, and what we help other partners who maybe aren't managed at this point it's here are the resources that are available to you like for example there's a team of people they're called partner advisory services that are available to all Microsoft partners that do similar work that what we do, they don't engage the same strategic depth. But for example, you're a, a partner and maybe you have a sales opportunity that you need some support with. Maybe it's around Microsoft Teams and um, phone system and calling plans. You can bring this, org this part of the organization in to help you with that sales opportunity. And they'll even help you construct demos to do for your customers. You can get uh, premier support hours through the Microsoft Partner Network membership. There's something called Dev Chat where you can have a conversation with uh, developers within this team about developing an app. And this isn't just for managed partners have this available to uh, available to them, but so do all partners. So I really encourage partners to become familiar with all the benefits that you get because. I've brought this team into to presentations that I've done and meetings that I've done, and, and it's been interesting. There could be 30 or 40 attendees in the room from different partners, and I asked the question, how many of you were aware that this was a benefit to you? Maybe a third of the hands go up. So two thirds of them were not aware. And then I say, well, how many of you were aware of all the capabilities here? Most of the hands go down. 
some of the biggest partners we have in Canada leverage this team consistently, and it's and they've got statistics that have shown how it's increased their their uh, revenue opportunities. So just because you're not a managed partner doesn't mean Microsoft won't work with you. There's teams of people all over Microsoft because remember, partners are what we need to be successful. Well, that's awesome. I think uh, I think you covered all the bases from uh, all the different areas, you know, that uh, a partner would need to understand and stuff like that. So I think it was really great um, to be able to have you on and share your insight and your knowledge and, you know, your boots on the ground kind of uh, information. So that was uh, really great. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody uh, for listening in. Hopefully uh, you enjoyed this episode as well as I did, and uh, we'll catch you on our next episode. Great. Thanks. thanks everyone. Thanks everybody.